Hey there, folks. Welcome back to Pretend World's Real People. As always, I'm Tyler, and I hope you had an amazing weekend. I definitely did, with a little staycation, and had a chance to check out the episode of Walker Independence called Random Acts that I was in, and they didn't cut anything. I was so happy. They used it all. Uh, it was just, it was great. As much as I hate watching myself on screen, I'm so glad that that was there. And tune in for this Friday, November 18th, uh, the third episode of the third season of Young Rock, and you might see a familiar face. I, I'm just saying Mike's. I don't know, you know, what's what's going to stay in and what's not, but uh, yeah, go ahead and check out that episode this Friday when you get a chance, or if it's past November 18th, 2022, watch it on, I think it's like NBC, Peacock, just wherever you can. Please check it out and support the show. Um, but that's all I have to catch you up on, essentially. Yeah, nothing crazy outside of the fact that I had a chance to talk with somebody that I've been wanting to talk to for, I don't know, collectively, probably over a year. And that is the amazing writer and director, Erica Tremblay. Now, I won't spoil anything about her story, but there are so many things in this interview that I could have added on to. I could have asked more questions. We could have talked for for hours on end because she is just incredibly talented and <laughs> very <laughs> humble and, and interesting. And her life story is uh, it was just so much fun to hear. So I'm not going to spoil anything about you know what's in it, but uh, a lot of laughs were <laughs> shared <laughs> in this episode. But uh, you can catch her work in FX's Reservation Dogs, one of my favorite shows of all time, and AMC's Dark Winds. So please, without further ado, let's welcome in, let's have a sit down, let's have a chat with the amazing Erica Tremblay. Uh, my name's Erica Tremblay. Uh, I am a writer director um, working in television and in feature films. And I am a member of the Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma. Scanout Svaguego. Uh, okay, I'm I'm super excited. I've been excited to talk to you for weeks now, but I do want to get started on where where you came from, your upbringing, how you found a passion for art and entertainment and filmmaking. When did that start for you? Sure. Yeah. Well, I grew up in Southwest Missouri, northeastern Oklahoma, right near uh, my my tribe's reservation. Um, I always just love storytelling. Like I love storytellers, my aunties and my uncles that would sit around at Thanksgiving and all like vie for like who can be the loudest and tell like the funniest, most entertaining story. And I always wanted to be in the middle of that competition. Um, and I, uh, when I was younger, I actually did not have cable TV, um, but I had a relative who did. And every couple of months we would receive a VHS tape in the mail and it would just be 90 minutes of MTV. And we would, my sister and like the neighborhood kids and I would pop in those, those um, VHS tapes and we would watch them over and over and over and over again. And it would have the commercials and everything, but I just loved watching these music videos, uh, you know, in the 1990s and watching all of them. And so that's really where I started like falling in love with like, like, I guess, audio visual in terms of like how to tell a story with like, with like video. Um, and, you know, my sister and I could also rent any of the 50 cent rentals at the local um, blockbuster kind of like, I guess it was a, like a local, like, like, local, like locally owned blockbuster, family owned it. And so we watched a lot of like Shirley Temple movies and like black and white films and like all of the stuff that was like cheap enough that my mom could afford. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I just fell in love. And at one point I convinced my mom to buy me this used VHS recorder at Goodwill and I started recording plays and trampoline routines and dances with all the neighborhood kids. I was definitely the bossy type A girl on the block. <laughs> um, but people would follow. And 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 I look back, we still have some of those tapes and they're hilarious. At the time, I thought I was like Scorsese or something. And, and now that's like loud lawnmowers, like you can't hear anything the kids are saying. And like, but I was still like in, interested in, in, in love the craft and you know, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to go to a local state school 
and I took media classes there. You know, I didn't know what film school was like. It wasn't I didn't know that I could make films really as a job. Like it wasn't something that seemed accessible to me. But I knew if I just took classes in those areas, I would um, uh, at least get as close as possible. But um, yeah, that's kind of my origin story. <laughs> it's You know what? I love those origin stories, especially those where you can go back years later, see your previous projects where you, <laughs> you guys thought you were the coolest kids on the block. You know, oh, we made a movie. We have these clips. It's great. And you said now you realize what your parents were going through most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> this is intangible. I don't know what to do with it, but we're going to support everything, you know, that he's doing. That, yeah. uh, no, that's just, it's such a sweet origin story because I feel like a lot of um, kids nowadays won't uh, have that experience, you know, where things are further disconnected and, you know, we didn't have cell phones to record things on and it was just, it was more of a craft than anything. So while you, you know, were going to a state school and taking media classes, do you feel like you had... A, a personal leg up with that experience or did you feel like maybe you had a little bit more to learn to catch up to everybody else yeah I mean I think even whenever I was in college like I I'm I got out like a major in media studies and a lot of it was like journalism focused and um it was fine I guess I still think um at that point in my life, I didn't know that I could make movies. Like it still wasn't something, I mean, especially like that would have been in like 2000, right? Like I'm, I'm aging myself here, but, um, I think like the idea that like, a that, you know, I, first off, I was like a young woman and I was also like a young woman, like coming from where I came from, like, I just didn't even see that accessible. Like I'm also queer and I was like coming into like what that meant. So there was just like a lot of like, I guess identities that I was like grappling with at that age. And so I was like taking these courses, but I think it wasn't until Sofia Coppola's film. Um, um, oh my gosh, my brain, the one uh, with Scarlett Johansson. Uh, Lost in Translation? Lost in Translation, yes. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I think I remember that film coming out and like being so like kind of like shocked that there was like a woman's like directed by a woman. And like prior to that, I mean, I was like a 20 year old human being. And prior to that, I don't think I had like really thought about it. Like, could I do it? Or was it even something that women do? Like, I mean, it is really strange when you stop and think about like, those things that are subconsciously like coming into your brain about what you have access or what you have permission to do. And so it's not as if that was like one of my favorite films of all time, but like just watching it and seeing a woman's name after directed by clicked something in my brain. And I was like, Oh, I, I could actually make a music video, like not just with the VHS recorder in my backyard. Like I could actually maybe make a movie um, and so that was like, um, started kind of a, a lit a fire under me to start thinking about how to really make things. And after I graduated from college, I ended up in Nebraska, um, and, and palled around with a group of, of other young people who were interested in film. And we would volunteer for each other's films on our little tiny shoestring budgets and like we had a I remember we had like a GL2 like camera <laughs> that we had and we would each weekend we would shoot someone else's short film and so that was they I mean they're not great I mean they're they're a step up from the backyard trampoline routine but it was really kind of a wonderful experience to just be um experimenting and and um playing uh around with the medium um but it did take me a long time to even imagine that it was something I could do yeah and you, you honestly took the words right out of my mouth with the lighting a fire under you you know and I, I'm honestly curious to see what you had in mind before you had that revelation did you have a, a backup sort of career as or aspect um sort of uh goal that you had before you wanted to you know, fully dive in and start making music videos and films and things like that? Yeah, I was a little bit wayward, to be honest. Like, I thought maybe I would be a journalist. Um, because again, like, I was just like, oh, I can, I, these are what the multimedia classes are, are around like broadcast journalism. Um, but it, I took those classes and like, I did my little like news packages. And I think I did an internship at like a news station. And 
Um, but I, I, it didn't quite fulfill the need, but it was kind of close to that. But when I graduated, I, I just didn't have a drive to become a journalist. Um, and so when I was living in Nebraska, I was, <laughs> this is funny, but I was simultaneously working as a nanny and a stripper. And I was like, working and I was using that money to kind of like funnel into like my like cheesy little short films. And I was kind of wayward with what I was going to do with my future. Uh, I just knew that like I was enjoying um, trying to make things on my own. Um, and I don't think I thought of it as a potential career. I don't think I thought of anything as a potential career. I was <laughs> kind of like, all right, I need to make rent and I need to buy some more tapes. Um, how am I going to get the money to fuel this like weird fun side thing I'm doing? And it's such an like artistic way of going about making money too, right? Like, okay, I'll, I'm, <laughs> I won't even ask which came first, like stripping or nannying, or maybe they just happened <laughs> on the same day, but that is, you know, this the very artistic, uh, just almost bohemian way of approaching how to su like supplement your living and your art. That's insane. That's well, and as a young woman, like to make money, those are like two jobs that don't really require. Um, I mean, they require a lot of effort. They're both very hard jobs, but like the barrier of entry is not super high. Yeah. You know? And, and so, you know, I didn't tell the people I nannied for that. I was also like moonlighting at the, <laughs> sex worker but um and i i never got caught i'm sure that they they i'm so open about these things now this is so many years ago i'm sure they would probably have some thoughts around it but i was a good nanny you can you can do both you can be yeah. both you know yeah it, oh my god with the <laughs> i don't know the, the thought of the parents finding out at that time or you know maybe maybe they the dad comes in night. i always yeah. i always thought maybe that would happen uh uh it didn't so but i can write that into a show i i, I could be inspired oh yeah i'm surprised you haven't already i mean <laughs> this, this, a show based around those two careers juxtaposing each other but also coming together would be really fascinating to see <laughs> yeah so, Definitely. I mean, as you were, you know, making your your films and your projects, were you writing as well? I, I mean, do you tend to to write with a pretty even balance to filmmaking or is there sort of one or the other? It's such a good question. So it, I think that where I came about to my present day career of working in writers rooms and, and, and producing and directing and, and um, writing my films is um I had written one of the short films that I made kind of out of necessity, but I, I did not do well in English or grammar growing up. And I, again, like there's these kind of weird things where I didn't think I could be a writer because I didn't know where commas went. And I certainly don't even to this day fully understand what a semicolon is. And so because of this kind of like, I guess, and at the, you know, at the time there wasn't as, much I mean the internet existed but it wasn't where it is now today where Grammarly you know was a oh, something God. you could pay for or whatever but um so I was like making I was directing things that other people wrote and I had wrote a couple of my own and I never I, I did not think of myself as a writer until a few years ago actually and um I remember so we I was living in Nebraska and a, a feature film came through it was an independent um, feature film. Dave Foley was in it, I remember, and Leah Thompson. And I got a job as a PA on the film. And I remember meeting these people from LA and they were just like normal people. And again, it's kind of like seeing Sofia Coppola's name. I had always just assumed that I was not the right pedigree for Hollywood and that I wasn't like the I couldn't do that. Like, right. Cause it's just like, if you, I, I don't know how to explain this like discovery, <laughs> but when I worked on this film and like the AD who was my boss and like, I was just like, man, like I'm laughing and joking with them and like I'm working and like, they all like, I, they seem just like normal people. And so I, after working as a PA on that film, I remember like once I save up, I think it was like $2,000. I was like, once I save up $2,000, I'm going to move to LA. 
And so that's what I did. I, I finished out my nanny gig and I was working at the night before club and I danced. And when I had $2,000, I got my little Mitsubishi Mirage and I drove out to Los Angeles. Um, and that's where I kind of like, you know, started working in the industry. That might be the lowest amount I've ever heard anyone bringing to, <laughs> to move to LA. Hey, listen, when you, bro when you grow up on like commodities and like you're broke, I mean, yeah. at one point my mom did get us a stepdad and we like got to like buy like Gatano jeans and like Levi's and stuff. But you know, like I didn't have much. And when you're used to not having a lot to me, to me, $2,000 was a lot of money. And I was lucky that I had, um, and a, a friend of mine's brother lived in North Hollywood and I had a couch to sleep on. Oh, wow. And so I went out and crashed on like this random person's couch, this kind person who, you know, ended up being a dear friend of mine. But um, yeah, I had $2,000 and a couch to sleep on and just kind of like a dream, I guess. <laughs> oh my God, that's fantastic. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard on set when I was coming up you knew you needed like 10 or 15 grand saved up to go to LA. And to me, I felt the same way. How, how am I going to outside of like selling my butt on the street, you know, and, and going a completely different direction, how am I going to make that much money? So like $2,000 to me seems far more tangible, you know, to find a place, start looking for work and just, so did you start working as a PA or were you just, you know, looking at like bar jobs, maybe even some club jobs? What were you looking for at that point? Yeah. So I, um, yeah, I also have to say that was in 2005 ish, maybe. So inflation is a real thing. <laughs> yeah, like, that, you that know, <laughs> everyone out there listening, you need more than $2,000 <laughs> to move to Los Angeles. And I was probably an idiot and needed more back then as well. Uh, um, <laughs> this, uh, this do not do as I did. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I started working. Um, I got some like PA jobs, um, in various different kinds of industries. Like, like I was working for, and that was when startups like Facebook was taking off. And so there was like, there was a little bit of work in some, like in that area. And so I would like PA there. And, um, I, I did work at a couple of clubs. I think like, you know, again, like dancing for me was a way to, and cocktail waitressing was like a way for me to, and listen, I was not a very good stripper. Like it was not like, like I'm a very, I'm a much better writer and director than I am a stripper, but it was def it was a way for me to, you know, pay the bills. And, and, um, I then, I didn't do that for very long because I kind of like fell into some jobs and, and, and was able to move in with roommates and, and make a go of it. And I, I, uh, got a job at one point working, um, as an office assistant at the stunt company called 8711. Um, at the time, you know, and they still are like a, the premier, um, one of the premier stunt groups, um, in Hollywood. So they did like the matrix and Chad Stahelski and David Leach, who've gone on to do, um, some incredible, like they've directed like huge Hollywood budget films. They were my bosses. And I worked at this like stunt gym with all these incredible athletes that did like, I think while I was there, we did 300 and, um, some other, so it was cool because I got to like touch upon like these really huge massive films um and then at the same time I was doing coverage and reading a lot of scripts for Chad and David because they wanted to direct so they were looking for vehicles and for projects to be their first um for their first outing so I did a lot of reading of scripts and um I jumped a lot on the trampoline that was in the bill you know <laughs> and I did that for a few years and um uh, and it was cool because like, there would be like lots of stars would come in there and do their stunt training. So like, it's really humbling to like see Scarlett Johansson out there, like doing like squats and trying to do pull-ups and stuff. And like, you know, like she's like this huge star and there she is just like being a human being. And like, once again, I think it was like everything inside of my, uh, journey has been recognizing that these things that you think are like unattainable or are being done by superheroes or someone outside of you everyone is just a human being like doing what they do right <laughs> and so it kind of like helps it helped me at least with my um motivation self-esteem and like you know always trying to knock down um that imposter syndrome that exists but 
at some point I needed health insurance. So I got a, um, a, uh, entry level position at an advertising agency. And I worked, um, in LA and built my career around producing, um, advertising, uh, commercials. I worked on Kia Motors, Carl's Jr., like a bunch of like big name brands at this really, um, you know, nice agency. And um, I did that for many years um, and then left L.A., ended up living in the city, in New York City. Um, I crossed over into doing um, publishing. So I worked at the Hearst Corporation, doing all of the digital output for their flagship brands like Marie Claire, Harper's Bazaar. and so. Long story short, I went to LA with the dream of directing films and being, um, you know, in that industry, but ended up kind of getting sucked into advertising, did that for many years, built out a really like lucrative, successful career. And then, you know, woke up at like 36 and realized that this dream I'd had as a kid with the VHS camera had not yet been fulfilled mm. and, and was like, okay, what next? <laughs> <laughs> It's funny how that works out, right? Especially for artists. But I mean, look where that has taken you now. I mean, all those years of experience working in publishing and advertising, you've just come full circle. I mean, in that time when you're working in publishing or in advertising, were you still making, you know, short films or your own personal projects to just sort of like satiate yourself? Or was that completely, you know, distant for a little bit? <laughs> I love the word satiate because that is such, that's like the perfect way to put it. Yeah. I was working in these jobs where I was close to the cameras, like yet again, like I was close to the creative. There was an element of creativity that was involved in doing the work. Um, but I wasn't satiated. Um, I did a couple of documentaries, um, just like being a stripper i'm also like not the best documentary filmmaker like i i i will oh, not come like, on. Tout, tout myself as a great documentary filmmaker but i but it was a way for me to exist right like it was a way for me to get by and satiate that creativity but like in all reality like i love making up stories i love creating worlds and so when i was a documentary filmmaker i was just like not good at being like 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 I'm biased and I wanted the story to go one way and I you know and so <laughs> I am grateful that I made the docs that I made and I am so grateful to all the people who were involved and did them and I'm not trying to discount them in any way but I will say that I wasn't satiated even working in in, in advertising and making docs on the side I still had this like gaping hole in like um in this like creative space in my brain and heart. Yeah, that honestly, I, I can relate to that because I'm doing some marketing stuff right now while paying for, you know, my career. <laughs> but there's stuff in there that you come up with, you know, because you're creative that they think is completely brilliant. And you're like, no, that's like the easiest thing. Like, I, I, I literally just came up with it. How are you guys not getting this? So I'm sure you've had like a series of those interactions with people like that in that, you know, that type of business. But, you know, you yeah, wake up. And, I mean, not to you know, interrupt you, but. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah, and I was producing in that world. So I was the one taking the notes. Mm -hmm. I was the one doing all of the administrative tasks. And I think that, you know, at one point I actually tried to become a copywriter and I wanted to be on the creative side, but I was told no. Um, you know, I, it, it, and this is the same way, like I remember working in, in Hollywood before I became a producer, I was an assistant to this producer who, you know, told me I'd never be a creative in Hollywood and I should just stick to administrative tasks. I mean, there's been so many instances in which, I've been told to my face, no, you cannot do this for varying, for various reasons. And so it, it wasn't just that I was working in those space. Like I, I, um, I look back on it now and I think, wow, like, um, I'm so glad that I didn't listen to all of those voices because like, if I would have believed that I couldn't be a copywriter, um, when they told me that I couldn't, I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be staffed on 
Reservation Dogs, my favorite show on TV. And, and somehow, and I, I don't know where that person was inside of me. I was like, well, fuck you. Like, maybe you're right. I can't be a copywriter here because you're saying no, but I'm going to go hone in my craft other places. And so not to say the joke is on them, but I am glad that I didn't give up on myself. Yeah. In case you, you know, uh, listeners, I'm wearing my don't give up shirt. <laughs> my nerdy shirt uh but yeah it's really interesting how that affects your psyche of people saying no you can't you'll never you know no you'll never or you're not good you know the, those kind of uh descriptions are horrible to hear in the moment but you it again not to use it the same way but it lights a fire under you you know for years on end so you you came back full circle just creating and writing and and making films i mean i watched the trailer for your roller derby documentary and i want to check that out because it just it like made me tear up while i was watching the trailer i'm probably gonna hate her for watching this because i'll just be covered in (laughs) in salty tears uh but it just you have this and i want to see if maybe we can uh, expand upon it but you have this knack for creating um, really personal moments, either visually and, uh, or even narratively, and also both most of the time, especially with you'd brought up reservation dogs. It's my favorite show on TV as well. Like I can't watch a single episode of that without feeling like something uh, I've been through can correlate directly to what one of the characters is going through. Uh, and I don't know where I was going with that. I'm getting lost in my thought, but <laughs> this is an off the wall interview, guys. Um, but I do want to touch on how you came into, you know, writing on that project, working on sure. that project, and especially Dark Winds, two projects I've auditioned for and hope, you know, now that they've both been renewed, I can audition for again. Uh, but they're just fantastic. There is this cultural significance to them that finally is being accepted widely, especially by TV networks. So I'm just curious how you came into contact with, uh, with I believe it's Sterling Harjo is you know still the showrunner for res dog so how did that happen for you yeah so there i was taking the train in and out of my like fancy job um uh as the head of video at a major you know publication and i was just not happy again i was thinking back like how can i like i should be this should be a sex in the city moment but instead (laughs) i'm like feeling like so depressed like i should be like on top of life and um, I, uh, quit my job. I moved to a small, uh, reserve, um, a small res in Canada and started a three year long language program in Cayuga, which is my native language. And I, um, I started applying to things. I applied to, um, I sent a script into the indigenous program, um, and I got into the, the the lab and Bird Running Water, who ran the program for many years, like saw something in my writing. And I it was the first thing that I had written um, since I lived in Nebraska. Um, and it was one of the like the first times like the things that I had written prior, I didn't have script software. So this truly was like the first time I wrote something in final draft. and. Um, I knew that this lab existed and I didn't really know about like the indigenous um, uh, filmmaking community. It wasn't something that was on my radar at all. And uh, I did this lab. Sterling Harjo was one of my mentors. Um, I went back home to Oklahoma and I I filmed the short. Um, Sterling was an EP on the project. Um, It was just kind of a dream scenario in which the film ended up getting into Sundance and I it premiered I got repped immediately um I think the the short film made like IndieWire's top 10 must see like shorts at the festival that year and um I signed with reps I had like my first staffing gig like lined up pretty quickly after that and um yeah I don't know I I wrote uh, I co-wrote uh, my feature film that I just directed um, with another amazing and amazing indigenous writer, Michiana Elise, um, over the pandemic. And um, 
I got staffed on Dark Winds was my first room. And that was a, uh, you know, great experience to be in an all native writers room. And then I got staffed right after that um, on Sterling's uh, show, Reservation Dogs. I directed an episode of Reservation Dogs this spring. Uh, and then I just directed my feature film. Uh, we just wrapped a couple weeks ago and I'm in season three's uh, writer's room for Reservation Dogs right now. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things where I just uh, needed to go back to community. Um, and, and while I was learning the language, I was just inspired to write and inspired to, um, I guess, believe in something um, bigger than what was right in front of me. And, and um, I'm really grateful that, that I had like, all of my mentors and all of my language teachers and, and continue to be grateful to my community for supporting me and kind of believing in me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just continues my life. I'm I'll, I'll be 42 and, uh, I'll, I kind of continue to not believe that I am these things like to say out loud that I'm a writer. It feels weird to say out loud that I'm a director. It feels weird. Um, because for so much of my life, that's all I've wanted to do, but I didn't know I could, or I, I, and I didn't feel like I had the permission, which is so weird. And so like, as soon as I stopped seeking permission to do things, um, is when everything kind of broke open for me. Um, but yeah, I was 26 when I, when I landed in Los Angeles around that age. And then I was 36 when I really started believing I could be a filmmaker. And so it's been a very long um, process by which I arrived here. Uh, and I'm sure that I, I have a lot more learning uh, and a lot more, uh, hopefully a lot more, uh, you know, projects and things to do in the future. I, I hope so. I mean, coming from someone who is a little biased because I love, you know, both projects you've worked on, especially your work on the episode of Roofing for Reservation Dogs, because it showed so much, you know, essentially how I left high school and went, Oh my God, I don't know anything. Uh, and going into, you know, a trade or a job, but um, you know, everything you're doing now is laying this, this great foundation to what, you know, upcoming artists are, are looking for. And for personally, for me, it's being an indigenous, you know, uh, actor and a writer who five years ago would never have guessed this would, you know, this would happen for anybody. You know, we have the, the greats like Gary Farmer and Wes Tootie, uh, who've been doing it for years, but you know, there's never been this like overall acclaim and this appreciation for native storytelling and native artists. So I'm super excited to see what you do next, honestly. And it's, I it brought up something uh, that my, uh, my grandfather's basically my, my father and he, and it sounds super cliche, but he says everything happens for a reason and leaving LA going <laughs> to New York city, you know, and then, getting back to it in your mid thirties, I feel like you're, you're just getting started. So with your, uh, if we can touch on it with your feature film, uh, could you give us a, a synopsis of, of what it's about or even just a, a gist of where you want to go with it? If, if the synopsis is too you know forthcoming. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, no secrets there. Um, I, you know, again, I, um, just want to give a shout out to like all of my mentors, but also like all the people who are doing such incredible like groundwork. It's funny because like you mentioned, there's this like feeling of a, of a, um, with dark winds, with Rutherford falls, with reservation dogs, with, um, you know, it feels like there's like a moment happening for indigenous creators. And I'm, I'm just so like, I'm so grateful to be a part of it, but you know, Sterling Harjo has been working for, years and years and years and bird running water and all the people that came up through his labs and Dennis and Sydney and uh Zoe Hopkins and there's just so many names that I can list off and I'm sorry to leave any off of of people who've been working for decades now as indi in indigenous creators making shorts making features like cobbling together budgets and it's really incredible to see all of their hard work pay off you know and 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 see their their um their recognition rise. Um, and it, it's because of their hard work that's made it possible for me to make my feature film and for me to, 
to be in these, be staffed in these rooms. And so I think it's really important um, to give a shout out to, to all of them um, who, who are bringing up like the next generation um, behind them and um, carving, carving the way for us. Um, I, uh, while I was studying uh, up in Six Nations, studying Cayuga, I was inspired by how the language is um, feminine in nature and how everything de defaults to the feminine, whereas in English, it's human and, you know, like it, it's the opposite in, in, in Cayuga in many ways. And so I was inspired to imagine a modern day world in which young people spoke the language because right now our elders are, um, are moving on and we're losing our first language speakers. And so I wanted to write a script in which the language was spoken in an everyday way by young people. And I wanted to center the story around, um, young women, um, and, and, and queer and two spirit folks. And so the film follows, um, uh, a woman, a hustler who, who kind of gets by on her reservation by shaking up the white people who pass through, uh, and, uh, uh, her sister goes missing and she's left as the unlikely caretaker to her 13 year old niece. Um, and when CPS shows up and removes the niece from the house, uh, our protagonists, um, jail breaks her from the foster home and the two of them head out, um, on the Oklahoma highway to get to a powwow. Uh, and it's a story, um, about, you know, this aunt and this niece and, and how they connect over, um, this kind of like horrible trauma that they're experiencing with, with this woman with their mother slash sister gone missing. Um, but it's really a, 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 a film about how our matrilineal ties bind us together uh, and how the love between these two individuals can help them transcend, um, you know, the, the trauma they're experiencing. So it was really uh, amazing to go back to Oklahoma this summer. Uh, like you said, I shot roofing for res dogs this spring and I got to go back and work with a lot of the same crew on my feature and uh, Lily Gladstone, who's just an incredible, incredible uh, native uh, actor is in the film along with an up, up and coming young woman um, named Isabel. I mean, it's just such a gift. Um, I'm, I'm editing right now, which is like, <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm not editing the film, but I'm working with the editor. We're in the edit process right now. And every day you learn something new and, a challenge um, appears and you, you decide whether or not you're going to slay it that day uh, <laughs> and you figure out a way. Um, but I'm really excited. The film is called Fancy Dance. Um, and, you know, I hope that, that it reaches audiences sometime next year. Ooh. Okay. That was going to be my, my follow-up question is when, <laughs> because it obviously wouldn't, uh, or is there potential that it could be finished for Sundance this next january with the editing and post and everything do you, is I there mean, a chance of I'm, I'm not putting any pressure on myself to okay. to to make it into sundance i mean what a great story to to be able to take it back to sundance because mm -hmm. we took the film through all of the development labs at we did screenwriters and directors and producers lab at sundance um but for me uh it's always just been like let's make the best movie and um, I want to have the time and the space and the runway to create um, the best version of Fancy Dance. Um, so like, hey, if in January I'm up on that stage introducing the film, it'll feel like homecoming uh, to be back there. Um, but if 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 we, you know, if I can't finish the time, finish in time or, you know, at one way or another, we'll find the find a, a beautiful home for the film, I hope. and. Um, for me, it, it's, 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 um, I kind of approach my writing in the same way that it's just like, you know, <laughs> just hurl yourself into it and the, the product will do the, do its job. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually going to be one of my questions. It's one of my favorite questions. Uh, I tend to write on, I have three dry erase boards, uh, for just rough outlining and I go full beautiful mind on it. Uh, it looks horrible, but I always like asking, you know, other writers, especially screenwriters, what their process is like uh, when you outline, when you have a rough idea, 
Do you tend to go uh, longhand? Do you tend to go on the computer? What's your What's your approach to that? Oh, it's so painful. Like, <laughs> I writing is one of the hardest things that I've ever done in my life, and I have not had children, but I, I, I've been told that when you have a baby, your body creates a chemical that that causes you to forget the pain of having a child so that you'll have another one. And I'm quite certain that, that when you write a script, your body also makes the same chemical um, or else you just would never go back and do it again. Uh, it's a very like painful process for me. I have to lock myself away. I'll often like um, get an Airbnb or like, for example, for, for my res dogs episode um, that I wrote, I had to like go rent a place and just hole up and like, there's a lot of like hair pulling and, um, I do do a lot of outlining. I'll just usually do it in Google docs. I I write myself a lot of emails when I have ideas. I'll just from my email, write myself an email so that I can go back and just search. So if I search like sent to myself, I can see all the oddball ideas that I have. Um, but for me, it's, it's a, it's a very strenuous process. Um, but I do need to outline. It's, it's very important for me before I start to write that I know exactly where I'm going. Um, I never thought of myself as being funny. I still don't, I don't, I don't exactly know why Sterling has me in the room. I, he's such a genius that I know that there's got to be a reason so I don't question him as like our leader I'm just like okay if you believe I should be here I'm here um but when I wrote that episode it was like I was like I don't know how to write a joke for Willie Jack like she's the coolest person alive like how can I write a joke for her um and so it was a really like painful process but I did it and like there's that amazing feeling that you have when you hit send and then you get feedback and then eventually it gets seen and people have reactions to it. But yeah, I outline, I need ideas. I have to have like, I need to know where I'm going and I really need to be able to throw my whole being into it. I'm not a casual person who can wake up and write two hours in the morning and then go about their business. Um, I'm a procrastinator and I wait till the very last minute and go into a dark hole and then come out the other side. <laughs> I think a lot of listeners are going to try to either rent out a place, isolate themselves when they, you know, go to writing or outlining. So I can't tell you how many times uh, I've gone somewhere with my partner and we're, we're eating and then the conversation just gets quiet and she'll say, you're just write it in your phone. Right? And then you can work on it when you get home. <laughs> just get it out right now. <laughs> are you sure? Yes. Get it out so we can talk about what's happening right now. Um, that's uh, yeah. we have to have supportive partners in this yes. industry, like <laughs> like for sure. Uh, you have to have supportive partners, supportive siblings, supportive parents. Um, and uh, they, you know, a lot of people don't have families, and that's that. Then who are the what? Who is your chosen family that is supportive? But yeah, it takes a lot of uh, uh, it's a lot of work. I think people don't un like think oh, it's like so cool. You write and direct TV. And it's like the dark side of that is that it's, um, it expects a lot out of you directing and writing, um, and just being in the industry itself expects a lot from you. Um, and so you have to like set your boundaries and, um, you know, pr protect yourself in many ways. Um, and, and yeah, you have to find what works for you in terms of your process. Like everybody's different and there's no one way or right way to do it. Um, and just be easy on yourself as you're going along. <laughs> it's, it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> it totally does. <laughs> well, I mean, w with that, what, what gives you, I mean, what else outside of this, uh, do you have a passion for that gives you release that allows you to you know, sort of <laughs> decompress from that pressure that one, the business puts on you and also you put on yourself. What, what else do you like to do in your, uh, in your time? I, I like to, um, watch trashy TV. <laughs> I really love watching like bad 
like reality television shows like I that's I decompress at the end of the day by doing that I can just turn my brain off I I my my sister recently moved up to upstate New York like we're on Cayuga Lake we live on our ancestral lands like we grew up in Oklahoma but now we're back to where like our our you know fam our ancestors or you know family would have been or was so I'm rediscovering like um like things about myself and things about like the land I'm living on. I love to go on hikes and um, spend time with my nieces and my nephew um, and my partner. And uh, I, I think that for so long, this idea of writing and directing was my outlet and like was the creative thing that I, I still feel like every day when I wake up and I log on to like dark winds writers room, reservation writers room, or, I'm working on a pilot with Sterling for another project or I'm doing, you know, to me, it's still while painful in certain instances, because, you know, you have to like do the process of creating. It is such a dream that my outlet and my, um, uh, like is my job. Like the thing that I love to do the most is my job. And that is such a gift and it's such a privilege that I know that not everyone has. And because I worked in, in various industries and worked for so long trying to get here, I understand what a privilege it is. And I understand what the access that I have means now, because I used to be a person for so long that didn't have the access. So for me, I do the best that I can to go back to these programs and mentor at Sundance or find people in my own community who are making short films and like, you know, figure out what, in what ways I can help support their prowess. And, um, I'm reminded on the daily that everyone has a story to tell and that everyone's story is as worthy as the next. I may get paid to write on in Hollywood, but, but the value of someone who's not getting paid to write is, is, is the same as, as mine. And hopefully I can, I can keep working in this industry and learn from Sterling and Sydney and all the other folks who've helped me get to this point and help others get to this point and have it be that same process of lifting more folks up. Um, so very long winded answer to say that my outlet is my passion and my passion is writing and directing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. And honestly, it gives uh, not only the listeners of this show, but also myself that uh, that hope and that further inspiration to keep doing what we're doing to join those groups, take the labs, keep writing what we can make our own stuff uh, to, to try and, you know, eventually do the same thing that you did turn that into a career. Uh, so that's I think it's just crazy inspiring. And <laughs> with the the crazy career and, and life you've had so far, uh, I can't wait to ask you this question. I want to know if you have a party story you could share with us. Now, this could be something that happened in the industry, uh, in your personal life, but just a moment in your life that stands out so well that has had such an immense effect on your memory you could easily recount it at a party like that i tell at a party yes that happened at a party yeah that you could tell at a party sorry that's the i'm 120 episodes in and that question has never been revised because i just love like the conversation we have as we're talking about it so first off i love that you asked this question i have a google doc in addition to writing myself emails I have a Google doc and at the top of it, it's called Erica's cocktail party stories. And I have a running list of stories that I tell at parties or stories that other people tell at parties that entertain me, because I assume that if you have a story that you can tell and you tell all the time, try and work that into your script because you (laughs) find it entertaining. Other people must find it entertaining because you tell it all the time. (laughs) Um, So I love this question and I know exactly the story that I want to tell you. I can't uh, <laughs> it involves um working at 8711 back in the day in uh Inglewood where the gym was and um so Chad Stahelski um was the stunt double for Keanu Reeves so they were friends and um I knew that they were friends and I I'm not like a person who like 
is like a like a star person like I'm just like oh like whatever like so this isn't name dropping because it's so embarrassing I have to just tell the story <laughs> so Keanu Reeves who you know by all accounts is one of I think the nicest people in Hollywood like in my uh experience but also in this moment where I had not met him yet that was like the rumors or like his people are like yeah Keanu is great and he's nice and all these things so I in addition to doing script coverage and all of these things, I would also like get waters and coffees. I was the shop assistant. So office assistant, I would like, so Kiana comes in, him and Chad are sitting in this other room. I'm like, you know, hi, can I, to Keanu Reeves, I'm like, hi, can I get you um, a water or a coffee? And he's like, yes, coffee. Um, and I um, was wearing this like scarf that day. Yeah. And there was this door that separated like the office area um, from like this, the stunt gym couch area. And when I came back out um, with, with his drink, the scarf got caught on like the door handle, the like the hooked door handle up and down. And it, I didn't realize it and it choked me. And I spilt the drink all over Keanu Reeves and choked myself and let out like a squawk. Um, <laughs> and Chad just like looks at me and is like, go back in there and just leave, go. Um, because I'm just clumsy. And like, it was like one of the most embarrassing moments of my life that here I had the chance to meet this like, or make it any sort of impression on this this human being that that is got this great reputation and is like famous and I managed to like choke myself squawk like a chicken and spill a drink everywhere um and so I always think back to that moment that like it can't I can't embarrass myself in Hollywood any more than I already have <laughs> but honestly of all the people for that to happen in front of I know it, it it's it's a double-handed sword because he's the nicest person in Hollywood but it's also Keanu Reeves. Uh, you know what? I'm sure you pulled off the dismount with grace. <laughs> well, my hope is to somehow like work my way back up to being in a scenario or a situation where I can just like say, hey, I know you will never remember this, but you are my cocktail party story. <laughs> and you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if he does remember it. He's that kind you of know, person. Per perhaps he does. <laughs> no, I love I'd it. I'd like I to hear it. his version of the story. Uh, because who knows how mine has changed and molded over the years. I am oh. native after all. <laughs> <laughs> well, honestly, if by some grace of whoever is up there, uh, he joins the show, I'm going to ask him about it. Uh, but if you see him before me, you, you have to tell me how it goes. <laughs> I'll come back on and let everyone know. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, with that, you know, being said in that experience, uh, this goes along really well with advice that you could possibly pass along to those who are starting out in the business or those who are in it. And uh, like my shirt says, don't want to give up. They want to keep going. Uh, do you have anything you could pass along to them that maybe has helped you in the past? You know, I, it's so weird to be asked to give advice because I just still feel like I'm learning every day and learning so much. And I think that that is what I would say is that, um, just don't take anything too seriously and be willing to bend around your ideas and mold yourself and learn from others and, um, gracefully fall down and get back up. And, um, you know, people are going to say no way, 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 way more than they're going to say yes. And those no's have nothing to do with you or your talent or like your um, value in the world of storytelling. And, and, and like I said, like find, find peers or people around you that are doing the same and support each other. And, um, maybe it'll hit. I, I wake up every day thinking that this career that I've, I've made over the past few years can be taken away. And, um, I, that would never stop me from, from creating. And, mm -hmm. and that word that you used earlier is like, find ways to satiate yourself, um, and use your talents and your passions to, to fuel, um, your output, whether that's at making a podcast, whether that's working in advertising, whether that's making a documentary, 
twirling around on a stripper pole, whatever it is, um, you know, those, your talents and your passions mean something. Um, and, um, it's, it might sound corny, but like, what else do we have? Um, but, but, but hopefully to believe in ourselves. You know, you were really nervous about giving advice, feeling that way, but I think that's the best level in a career to give advice because you're not somebody who's been in it for 30 years saying, yeah, you know, just, um, keep on keeping on. You know, like, what does that mean? <laughs> it's, uh, the advice just, it's, has a this like bold finish to it when it's somebody who still has imposter syndrome which I don't, I'm not sure if that ever goes away uh if it just feeds the creativity <laughs> she's shaking her head <laughs> well honestly like everything you're doing now everything I've seen and hope to see in the next year or so like I, I'm just ecstatic to see what comes next in your career knowing that you know you woke up you know, in your 30s saying, I want to get back into it and look where it's gone. Uh, with that and this episode, I wanted to see if there's anything that I could personally shout out with the show notes, whether it be obviously Reservation Dogs and Dark Winds and your film Fancy Dance that will be coming out hopefully sometime next year. <clears throat> if not Sundance, because, you know, I'll be over there. So that's kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> if there's anything else, an organization, a charity that you really believe in that I could also spread word on. Man, I don't know. I would, I, you know, there's so many great organizations that are out there working. Um, you know, I just worked with the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Um, um, they were so um, supportive when we were making Fancy Dance. So give them a shout, give them a look up. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's it's hard to answer that question. I, I think like, go watch a bunch of films, go watch a bunch of Native films. Um, uh, uh, look at Sterling's older work, look at Sydney, uh, Sydney's older work. Like, I think that, um, there's not enough of them that exist. And, uh, it's great to, to look back on all these folks that have been working so hard and, and all of the work that they've done. Um, so yeah, in the show notes, you should just put a bunch of, of native films for people to watch. Yes. Actually, I don't think I've done that yet. So <laughs> I'm super pumped about that. Uh, well, I before I stop this recording, I do want to say it's been a blessing talking to you. I was so excited to sit down with you. Can't wait to have you back on the show in the future, especially when your film comes out. Uh, but I just wanted to personally say thank you before things get really awkward, because uh, I like to do what we call an awkward goodbye. And I'm not sure if you've ever seen Wayne's World, if that's something that... I, I have seen it, but it's okay. been so long. Yeah, it seems to be the way with a lot of people. I think I'm the only I'm person good with who watches awkward. it. Whatever you throw at me, like, I'm so <laughs> awkward. And I mean, you've been with me now for an hour, and so has the audience. So I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone that I'm very awkward. <laughs> it's the best kind of awkward. We love awkward here. I'm awkward as hell. Uh, well, I'm going to give you a, a silent Wayne's World cameraman countdown. Uh, and when I get to one, I'm going to point to you. And when I point, give me your best verbal awkward goodbye, and I'll stop the recording from there. Sound good? Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. In. Onagihya.